Hey guys, welcome back. So today I'm doing part one of the new how to develop your own jailbreak series that I announced on New Year's Eve last week. Uh, so if you haven't seen this video already covering the overview of what this series will be, then go ahead and watch it. I'll leave a link in the description and then come back to this one. So this video, as, as I mentioned in this one, the first part will be covering the first exploit or the first vulnerability, which is CVE 2016-4655, and that is the info leak that will allow us to defeat ASLR in the kernel. So this is all we're going to be doing in this video. The next, uh, the more advanced stuff will come later. So the, the UAF will be in, in the latest parts. Uh, but for now, we're just going to focus on the info leak. So as I did mention in this video, I uh, highly recommend you read both these write-ups before re uh, watching this video because this will explain sort of the background details and it's good to have some prior reading on how this all works. Um, but let's go ahead and get started. So throughout the series, I'm going to be using my iPod 5 on iOS 8.4.1 to test the jailbreak on. So I recommend you also find a 32-bit device, preferably running uh, the same version as my one, uh, to try this on. It does also work on 64-bit devices, although I don't have a 64-bit device running the vulnerable version. So I can't show you guys how to do that, but you can try to figure it out for yourself if you want. So for the specific device and version that you've got, you want to download the IPSW for it. So in my case, it's the iPod Five running iOS 8.4.1 so you want to download the IPSW and uh, then you want to get extract the kernel cache file and decrypt it using the firmware keys that are published on the iPhone wiki so you do need firmware keys publicly available for your device I'm pretty sure all 32 bit devices now have these keys available but again if you're doing it on a 64 bit device then you're going to need to probably have a kernel dump or uh, maybe you'll get lucky and have a, a 5s which I think there are keys available for so find your keys and decrypt your kernel cache. I've got another video on this channel showing you guys how to do that, so I will not cover that there. But then you should have a file like this, 8.4.1 kernel, which will be decrypted, and then you can uh, inspect that using Hopper Disassembler or IDA Pro. And it also doesn't actually matter whether your device is jailbroken or not. You can obviously re-exploit the bugs even if the device is already jailbroken, which my one is. My 8.4.1 iPod is jailbroken using the ETA Son jailbreak by Teamstar. So I'm still going to be doing this on that device. It doesn't matter if it's re-jailbroken, if you're re-jailbroken it. So it will still work. So um, you can choose obviously to use Theos or Xcode to build the actual app that we're going to be working with. I'm going to be using Theos on the device itself. And uh, we'll get into the code in a minute, but first of all, I want to cover uh, an overview of what this video will uh, teach you guys how to do. So, as we already know, it's going to be covering how to exploit the info leak to leak the kernel slide. But uh, what is actually going to be involved in that? So, here's a quick exploit overview. So, first of all, we're going to craft a malicious dictionary, uh, which is then going to allow us to create an IO user client object in the kernel and use the dictionary to set these properties, which we'll then actually use to set a malicious uh, property, which will have basically an extremely large number that shouldn't normally be accepted. And then we're going to basically read that property back, which is going to allow us to leak data that we shouldn't have access to. And then we'll use that to then calculate the KSLR slide. So that's essentially the exploit overview um, at a higher level. Uh, also going to more detail. So the malicious dictionary, that can be represented in XML like this. So it's very simple. We have a symbol with AAA, just something we can recognize and then read back later on. And underneath that, we have a number with a size specified by us. In this case, it's going to be hex 200, which is 256. And this is actually where the vulnerability comes into play. So the, uh, the OS unserialized binary function, when it actually comes across a number, it will not check the length of the number and therefore allow us to create a number of any size we wish. So this is how it's vulnerable. So we're going to create one of hex 200 size and then we just give it a uh, an 8 byte number in hex. doesn't matter what that is. So I just used 4141 and, um, and then that's basically all it is. So obviously we can't actually submit it in an XML format. We have to do it in a binary format, which we'll cover in a minute. But it will essentially look something like this. So we'll have the binary magic or the essentially the identifier that shows that this is a binary dictionary. And then we have a, a, a di dictionary with two entries. And then we just do the same things. So we have the symbol with four characters, but we also include the uh, the null byte as one of those characters. So we have zero and then uh, the 41, 41, 41. And then we have the OS KRL serialized number with the size we specified and then the eight byte number underneath that. So to help you guys understand what is going on when we create the IO user client behind the scenes, uh, this diagram should help explain it. So we have the IO user client, and then we have the number, the 8-byte number that we specified. So there's the two 4-byte uh, numbers of 4141. And then uh, underneath that is going to be some other data and addresses and things we don't really care about. But somewhere down the line, and I believe it's position 9, uh, there will be the return address of the function we're currently in. Now this obviously should not ever be disclosed, we shouldn't be able to read this because that would allow us to defeat KSLR. So we have 
this this is basically the layout of the memory. Now, normally with uh, a an OS number, when we read the property back, we should only be able to read back um, eight bytes maximum, I believe, is the maximum number. So therefore, we should only be able to read back the actual values that we stored. But since we are able to create an arbitrary length number, which in this case is going to be hex 200, this allows us to read back a lot more data than we should be able to, and therefore we can read back other data uh, other than just what we what the values we actually submitted. So you can see we'll be able to read back as far down as this return address and therefore we actually read that back into our current process, our exploit program or exploit app, and we can then use that to calculate the ASLR slide. So that's basically uh, an overview of what this exploit is gonna do, and that's how we're gonna do it. So I'm gonna assume you all know how to make an iOS app, so what we're gonna do is create a new app, either with Xcode or Theos, and then open up the rootviewcontroller.m file, and first of all, paste this enum here, which has got a load of values and binary values next to it that will allow us to basically create the dictionary easily by referring to these words instead of actually typing out each binary value which will be a bit more uh, complicated. So you want to paste this here at the top of your root view controller file and then we're going to go down and create a new function for the kernel slide. We're not going to focus on the UI yet, we'll just focus on this get kernel slide function. So this will be a return type function so we're going to have an unsigned int type so we can actually return the value of the kernel slide and inside this first we're going to create a, var a variable for the case slide which will be currently zero and also for the fixed address which will calculate later and underneath that we're going to actually create our crafted dictionary which will be a series or an array of 32 bit ints so it's called as dict and then the first value needs to be d3 which is the magic number the one that identifies this as a binary dictionary and after that we just need to basically copy everything I showed in the diagram before. So it will be a dictionary with two entries. The first uh, entry will be a symbol with four characters. Again, as I said, including the null byte as one of those four. So we have three A characters. And then we want the uh, the OS serialized number, which will be our specified size of hex 200. And then we just need to include both of those 32-bit uh, numbers there. And then finally we need a variable underneath that which we'll use later. This just needs to be set to the size of the crafted dictionary that we just made. So next we need to create some variables that we'll need later. So we need an IO service type, an IO connect type, and an IO iterator type, as well as a couple of MUC ports. And then we're going to open up a connection to the IO master port, which will allow us to interact with any other IO kit service. So I do hope I'm getting all this information right, because it's actually my first time doing any kind of IO kit programming. So I apologize if there's any inaccuracies in this. Let me know in the comments if you know any more. Uh, but anyway, after that, we're going to check that the dictionary we created is actually considered valid when passing it to IO service get matching services bin, which is an internal version or private version of IO service get matching services. So you're going to need some private headers for that, which I'll leave in the description below. But we're just going to check if that function returns current success or not, because if it doesn't, the dictionary that we created has got something wrong with it, and therefore you need to go back and fix that before you can proceed. But um, next, we're going to open up a connection to Apple Key Store using IO service get matching service. And this is a service that will allow us to create an IO user client in the kernel and therefore set our own properties to it and therefore leak the bytes and calculate the ASLR slides. So we'll create that using IO service open extended and we'll pass in our dictionary as one of the values to therefore have that use that to set the properties in the user client. And therefore we have our uh, overlong number set as one of the properties there. So uh, you want to pass all those arguments and then check again that this has actually been created successfully using the same code. So we're going to check it returns current success. And uh, if it didn't, then something went wrong there as well. So this next part I don't actually fully understand myself because as I said it's my first time doing any kind of IOKit programming but what it seems is that the uh, the IOKit user client that we created has been uh, put in some kind of list or array of other objects and user clients that we need to iterate through first before we can access it. So first of all we're going to create some uh, variables to store the bytes we're going to leak and then we're going to create a while loop that's going to essentially uh, loop through or iterate through all of these different objects until we find the one that we want. So first of all inside the while loop we're going to free the previous object if there was one from the previous iteration of the loop and then we're going to use io iterator next to get to the next object in this list and essentially then we're going to just try and read off the property from this object to see if it is our object or our user client. So we'll read the AAA property using io registry entry get property bytes and uh, if this uh, actually retrieves any valid data, then obviously we have found the correct user client and then therefore we can proceed and the while loop will exit. So outside of this while loop, we now obviously have the leaked data from the kernel stack in a, a bytes uh, integer and in a buff uh, char array. Uh, so we're just going to write all this data to a file uh, using a quick for loop just so we can actually test this while we're developing the jailbreak so we can actually read what data we're leaking because this will be a vital step next so we know what to actually do with the leaked data so this for loop here will just print all of these bytes into the file in var mobile bytes.txt
So we're going to temporarily add the code to call the get kernel slide function from the view did load method and then just quickly run this on the device and you'll just see a white screen but it will still actually leak those bytes and create that bytes.txt file inside of var mobile. So you want to go inside of ifile and find that file, open it up and you should see all of the leaked data from the kernel stack. Now the value in the ninth position is the one you want to look out for. This is the return address for the function we're currently in and so we need to use this to calculate the slide. Now we're going to actually kind of cheat, we're going to use kdump bytes like user to dump the kernel from live memory memory and then we can actually compare this kernel dump against the static kernel that we decrypted from the IPSW using Hopper or IDA Pro. So you want to open them both up in uh, Hopper or IDA and then pick a function to compare the entry points of. So take both the entry point addresses from the static one and the slid one and then just take one away from the other to find what the slide was on this one live run of the kernel. So you can see there it's 198 followed by five zeros. Now what you need to do is take this value away from the address or value that you found in the ninth position. Now this is now the static address or the fixed address that you want to use in the exploit code. So you can go there and update that variable that we created earlier. So just put that value there. And then right at the bottom before we return case slide, you can actually update and calculate what the kernel slide really is by taking away that fixed address from the value we find in the ninth position or buff plus 36 because four times nine is 36. And then just return case slide after that, and it's calculated the actual case last slide. Now you can also do a quick basic UI, so you can actually display this in your app to the user by just correct calling that function and then displaying the result inside a simple UI alert view. So all that's left to do now is actually compile this code and run it on the device. Now to compile it, as I said, you will need those uh, private IOKit headers, which I'll leave in the description, so you can just download them and include them in the project. Uh, and then once that's done, you can run the app on the device and you can see it will just do a little uh, pop-up alert with the KSLR slide there displayed. So that value will change every time you reboot your device. It's calculated randomly by iBoot uh, as it boots the kernel. And uh, that is the first part of the jailbreak done. So that's the first exploit complete. The next one will come in the next video series, the next part of the video series, which I have no idea how long it's going to take me to make because this did take long enough. Uh, and this is just the, the info leak. So the next one could take... Uh, quite a lot of time to record and prepare so maybe a few weeks away but I will try my best to get out as soon as I can um, but if you want any more understanding on this then as I said again read the two write-ups I'll link them both in the description if you want more understanding how the actual underlying bugs work and how the exploits are actually possible if you have any issues or questions about the actual code shot in this video then leave me a comment or tweet me at BLS1000 and I'll try to help with anything I can uh, but that's pretty much it for this video. So I hope you guys enjoyed. Let me know what you thought in the comments down below. Thanks for watching. Don't forget to subscribe for more. And I will see you next time.